All right, my clock tells us that we have now passed over to one o'clock, so we'll go ahead and begin the program. So welcome everyone to the 22nd iteration of Planetarium Online. I'm Mike Shanahan, the Planetarium Director at Liberty Science Center. Ever since uh, March 12, we have been closed, like most institutions, but the folks who make our planetarium software called Digistar 6, has allowed us to use the software to bring the planetarium right to your homes during this time of closure. So we'll be using Digistar to bring the night sky to you and exploring, in this case, the September evening skies. As I mentioned, we are actually reopening on Labor Day weekend, both the Science Center itself, Liberty Science Center, and the planetarium will be open to the general public as of the Saturday of Labor Day weekend. Now, also, as I mentioned, uh, we have, we're lucky today to have not one but two planetarium folks in the chat. Both Andrew and Krista are there, so they'll be monitoring your astronomy questions. You can put your astronomy questions into them, and we'll leave some time at the end of our half-hour-long program also to address your questions at the end of the show. Finally, we've been trying to keep the, tor keep the torch alive of astronomy education throughout these five months of closure, doing a show every week. And if you would like to show your support to Liberty Science Center for that effort, we do have a donate button. It looks like a bottle cap with a heart in it. That is the official way to donate if you wanted to support Liberty Science Center. You've been very helpful in your support. Allows us to keep this, uh, this service going to our public, even past the opening time of our planetarium next weekend. So we'll have shows going on here online one o'clock on Thursdays, at least uh, every Thursday to the end of September. Okay, one final announcement before we go to the nighttime sky. One of the most regular attendees of this program is my mom. And I would like to give a big shout out to her on her birthday. Happy birthday, mom. Thank you for joining us and for being a supporter, actually, of Liberty Science Center's Planetarium online programming. All right, that said, let's go ahead and go to the evening sky as we would see it here this very evening. So we're going to be talking about the September skies, but let's go ahead and look at the skies as we would see them actually tonight. I don't know what the weather is like in your neck of the woods. We're getting some clearing. It's been that kind of a summer, uh, just kind of unpredictable weather, rainy and then clear and then clear and then rainy. So we're hoping for some clear skies tonight. And so we're hoping to get at least a glimpse of Jupiter and the moon this evening. And it looks like going into the weekend, Sunday especially, maybe a really nice um, view there. So going out to the nighttime sky tonight, the sun still goes down pretty late, going down around uh, 745 or so. It takes about an hour after the sun goes down before it gets really dark. So we'll stop here tonight at 930. So here's the sky you see this very evening the 27th of August at 9.30. So here's an important thing to note is that stars rise four minutes earlier every day and set four minutes earlier as we go around the sun. That means that a sky that's good for 9.30 tonight will be good for 8.30 in the middle of September and then 7.30 at the end of September. So what we're talking about here is gonna be a sky you can see throughout the month of September at the end of September, it'll be dark by 7.30, and so we'll have good sky viewing there. So there we are. We're looking out towards the skies over towards the west where the sun went down. And so as you're doing that tonight or any time in September, try to find a really bright dot in, directly in the west. And this dot will be the brightest star that we see in the August and September evening sky. This bright dot is pointed to by the handle of the Big Dipper. The Big Dipper can be your handy guide to finding this star, which is called Arcturus. We say that you follow the arc of the handle and it arcs you to Arcturus. So to make sure you have it, if you see a bright light there over in the uh, skies there, to make sure you have the right one, the brightest star in the sky, you can use the handle of the Big Dipper to point you right to the star Arcturus. Arcturus is in this kite-like shape of a constellation. It's by far the brightest star in Bootes the Herdsman. So the connected dot may or may not help you to visualize how you're supposed to make a herdsman out of that shape. 
And I'm not even sure the classical picture is going to help that much as we turn it on. Uh, the brightest star, Arcturus, is not even inside of the classical picture as we turn it on. Arcturus is down there. So if you don't see a herdsman, if you're not an ancient Greek imagining a herdsman, then see something that, relate, that you can relate to. So a common term for this is the ice cream cone with uh, Arcturus at the bottom. Imagine here's a pointed sugar cone and then a giant lump of ice cream on top of that. So it is a summertime constellation and is also a thing that goes away at the end of the summer. So it's a good way to say farewell to the summer to imagine this constellation of Bootes as the ice cream cone. Every night it'll be a little lower and we'll eventually lose it. Now Arcturus is a red giant star, far more massive than the sun, but it's also a sign of where we're heading. In five billion years, the sun will swell up into a red giant, much like Arcturus. Now, the star Arcturus is the fourth brightest star in the sky, so here it is, number four on the list of the Big 25. The brightest star, Sirius, will be appearing in the morning sky just before daybreak. We'll see that at the end of our show. But bad news, New Jerseyites, you can never see Canopus, the second brightest star, nor Rigel Centaurus, also known as Alpha Centauri. The second and the third brightest stars never rise from our latitude. So that means that Arcturus is it in terms of the brightest star you can see here in the August and September evening skies. Now we're going to go ahead and turn around to the northern sky and get a really good view there of the Big Dipper. The Dipper is always somewhere in the north, and oddly, the stars aren't bright, and yet it makes a really nice, easy-to-find shape because that Dipper shape is so distinctive. And that's great because it's also a good way to find the North Star. Now, the North Star doesn't make it on our list of the 25 brightest stars. It is, in fact, the 49th brightest star in the sky. And so it's really helpful to have a guide like the Big Dipper to show you the road to the North Star. North Star, by the way, is the brightest star in the Little Dipper, kind of a mini version of the Big Dipper. Now, these are local names you hear in North America, Big and Little Dippers, but uh, their official names are Big Bear, Ursa Major, and Little Bear, Ursa Minor. Now, when a thing matters to you, you invent your own name for it. And so people would see a herdsman 2,500 years ago or a fishing hook in the constellation of Scorpius. The problem is, wonderful as these local things are, when you begin to communicate nationally or internationally, it gets confusing if everyone has their own name for things. So to stop the madness, uh, in 1922, the International Astronomical Union, in their very first meeting, officially agreed upon 88 constellations and assigned every part of the sky to one or another constellation as kind of a roadmap to refer to as you're describing the nighttime sky. Now, among these 88 is another constellation called Cassiopeia. And like the Big Dipper, it's not a really bright constellation, and yet its distinctive shape pops out very clearly as you're gazing at the nighttime sky. I don't know why. It just, you look up, boom, there it is. And Cassiopeia is on exactly the far side of the Big Dipper from where the North Star is located, which makes it very handy if you have the, the uh, Big Dipper blocked, for example, by trees or by buildings as things get low in the sky, you can use Cassiopeia instead to find the North Star. If you're in San Diego, there's going to be a time when the Big Dipper is kind of below the horizon. So if you can't find the Big Dipper, take Cassiopeia, the squished W, take the three middle stars, and this makes an arrow that roughly, if only roughly, points you the road to the North Star. So it can be handy for that if you can't find the Big Dipper on a given evening. Now, as time goes on, the world turns and all the other stars pivot around the North Star, but it stays in place. So it's always there for you to find it as long as it's dark and clear and as long as you're north of the equator. From the Southern Hemisphere, you'll never see the North Star and there's not really a good South Star. Why is this? Well, the North Star happens to be almost exactly over the Earth's North Pole. And as we spin, because it's over the axis of our rotation, it stays in place. 
and all the other stars spin around it. In Hawaii, the term we had for North Star was Hoku Pa'a, the stuck star. So that's the northern sky. A lot of interesting things there. But things get even more interesting as we turn around and face towards the south. A lot of the action here in August and September 2020 is going to be in the southern sky. And again, as a reminder, the sky that you see here at 9.30 tonight, you'll see at 7.30 at the end of September or 8.30 in the middle of September. With one exception. The moon, that little speed demon, is going to be in a different place every night. It's going to be all the way over by Jupiter here tomorrow night and beyond Saturn the night after that. So tonight, go ahead and find that just past first quarter moon in the south. It should be quite beautiful, uh, but tomorrow night you're going to find it in a different place and a different place the day after that. But beyond, besides that, everything else we're seeing here is going to be visible all the way through the end of September and in the same places. All right, so looking towards the south, hard to tell where to start. There's so many great things in the southern part of the sky here. But let's begin with the scorpion, because that is a constellation we are saying goodbye to. So the scorpion already low in the west here at 9.30 tonight is going to be setting and behind the sun as we get into later in the fall. So the scorpion, one of the 12 signs of the zodiac, a really easy constellation to find, and was seen as the foe of Orion the hunter in mythology. He uh, slew Orion. They still don't get along. And in fact, uh, you'll never see Orion as long as the scorpion is there in the sky. Now in Hawaii, they didn't have scorpions till after Western contact. So instead of seeing it as a scorpion, as did the Babylonians and the Greeks and the Romans, the term to this day in Hawaii is Maui's great fish hook. Now thanks to Disney, the movies are a great help in doing astronomy education. Their film, Moana, talks quite a bit about Maui's great fish hook. And it's uh, the most enduring story about the nighttime sky that you hear in Hawaii. So Maui was a, is a demigod and a hero and a trickster. He's all these things wrapped into one in the Hawaiian worldview. And Maui went out fishing with his brothers one day, and he took his magical fish hook and tossed it in the water and told his brothers, no matter what happens, don't look back. So the fishing line and the hook hooked something and it had an enormous tug and the brothers are wondering, my gosh, has Maui caught a shark or a whale? They paddled for two days following their brother's instructions, but they finally gave up in frustration and looked back and discovered that Maui had hooked the bottom of the ocean and they were straining very hard to pull it up. So Maui's goal was to build a giant continent in the middle of the vast Pacific. But because the brothers looked back and broke the spell, the fishing line snapped and the fish hook went flying up into the air and stuck into the sky as the constellation of Maui's great fish hook. And also, because they broke the spell, instead of one continent, all that appeared above the water when the line snapped were the tops of the mountains, which are now the beautiful Hawaiian islands. And that seems to me to be a pretty good deal. I think we have lots of continents already. What we need is more beautiful islands. That story is found pretty much throughout Polynesia, very common also in New Zealand, for example. So looking towards the sky here, we're uh, next to the scorpion or the fish hook, we have another well-known constellation of Sagittarius the centaur, half man, half horse, although his name actually means the archer. He's firing an arrow there at the scorpion. There again, if you don't see a half man, half horse archer, you may find a more familiar shape. If you take the really bright stars in the centaur, you can turn it into a teapot. Here is the handle, the top, and the spout. So the teapot, a very common local term, and it, you have to add more stars to it to try to turn that into a giant centaur with a bow and arrow. So Sagittarius, due south here, 9.30 tonight, 7.30 at the end of the month, and the moon is also in there tonight only. So if you want to find Sagittarius tonight, find the moon and look right below the moon, and that's where all the bright stars of Sagittarius will be located. 
All right, so these constellations come back at the same time every year and will for hundreds and hundreds of years. What changes are the planets. The stars are so far away we can't tell their changes in thousands of years, but the planets being way nearer, thousands of times nearer, do shift against the starry background. The very word planet means wanderer. And this is a great September and actually a great fall overall for the planets. Starting with Jupiter, the brightest dot of light in the sky, in the evening sky tonight. So in a small telescope, you can see Jupiter and its beautiful banding. And you can also observe the four brightest and biggest of the 79 known moons around the planet Jupiter. Galileo discovered these in 1610 and with his newfangled telescope, and it was the proudest discovery that great astronomer ever made with his telescope. The four Galilean moons are called to this very day. Now, Jupiter outshines every star in the sky because it's really, really big. And like all planets, it's much closer to us than are the stars. So it's a good reflector of light. A giant ball of gas, there is no solid surface on Jupiter or any of the outer great gas giants. If you tried to land, you just sink down inside of Jupiter until that gas turned to a semi-liquid state. The planet spins uh, in nine hours and 50 minutes. That's how long one day on Jupiter takes. It turns very quickly, and that creates a lot of turmoil, which leads to these giant storms on the upper levels of the clouds. So coming into view now, the ultimate hurricane of the solar system. We've had a doozy, of course, just strike uh, the Louisiana area today. This hurricane, though, the Great Red Spot, twice the size of planet Earth. And on Earth, we have land that breaks up hurricanes. There's no land on Jupiter, so there's nothing to break up this hurricane. It's been going on for hundreds of years and possibly for millions of years. Now, Jupiter is going to be with us all of the fall. All of these four planets we're looking at are not going to go away until December time. And all through the fall, right next to the planet, Jupiter will have the planet Saturn. About the width of one palm will divide Jupiter from Saturn. Saturn, of course, famous for those fantastic rings. Even in a smallish telescope, you can tell there's a ring around it. And uh, it's also bright, not as bright as Jupiter in the sky because it's twice as far away and not quite as big. But uh, another beautiful gas world. The clouds are more subtle in their colors than Jupiter's are, but there are storm formations within the clouds of Saturn as well. The one you see here is roughly the size of the state of New York, sort of a little red spot on the planet Saturn. But when you're talking about Saturn, basically, we are talking about the rings more than anything else. That's the most distinctive feature. Ironically, there have not always been rings around Saturn. They were formed long ago when one of its moons was destroyed. And so there'll also be a time when the rings don't exist anymore, which is hard to think about the ring planet without rings. The rings appear to be solid from a distance, but they're not. They're made up of little bits of ice that are as small as a pebble and as large as a school bus, orbiting like billions of tiny moonlets around the uh, ring planet Saturn. So that is Saturn. The rings, by the way, razor thin, maybe 100 feet thick, even though 50,000 miles from one side to another. And Saturn, along with Jupiter, they're going to be pretty much side by side all the way until they vanish at the end of December. Christmas time is going to, when we're going to finally lose them in the light of the setting sun. Back tonight, 9.30, looking towards the south, those two amazing planets and the moon and Sagittarius and all. But now we're going to explore the Milky Way. So we're going to actually, uh, because the Milky Way is visible if you're out away from the bright lights of this city, that is a bit of a challenge is that this beautiful band across the sky is really hard to see to impossible to see from any major city. Any amount of light pollution and the Milky Way goes away. And I'm cheating here a bit because if you have the moon out as we do tonight, even in a dark location, it's going to wash out the Milky Way. You need kind of a moonless night away from the lights of the city. But if you're in that circumstance, uh, the summertime is a chance to look right towards the thickest part of the Milky Way. We're inside of our own galaxy and looking at the galaxy that surrounds us. 
So in the old days, all I could really do was to show the Milky Way in a star machine and then show you a slide of another galaxy. But modern planetarium systems like Digistar allow us to leap off of Earth and look back at our galaxy from outside to see why we're seeing this Milky Band. So as we pull away, let's just take a moment to point out the land we're leaving. So looking down on the Great Northeast, right here is Liberty State Park. That is where Liberty Science Center is located. We're right down here towards the bottom. To orient yourself, here is where the Statue of Liberty is located. Over here is Ellis Island with a great immigration museum that just reopened. And here is Lower Manhattan and fabled Brooklyn. So as you can see, we're very, very close to Manhattan, generally available via ferry and path and other means as well. So I hope we can all see you there at our actual planetarium, our 90-foot dome, the biggest dome in the Western Hemisphere. All right, pulling away, we're going to look back towards our neck of the woods from a distance of about 70,000 light years. And from this far away, we can see the Milky Way as it really is, as this beautiful whirlpool of about 250 billion stars. And inside of this circle is not only where the Earth and Sun are located, but every star you see is a dot of light, like the ones that make the scorpion, are inside of that little part of the Milky Way as well. So the stars we can see are also part of the Milky Way. They're just close enough for, for us to see them as dots. And that faint band are stars that are too far away to be seen as dots, but so many of them, they make that milky band across the sky. Right, heading back to New Jersey, that ability of modern-day planetariums to leap off of Earth and then go back has been one of the greatest things about going digital here. And here we are again. So again, it's 9.30 tonight. And again, we're looking towards the south with that beautiful Milky Way banding across the sky. So we're saying goodbye to the scorpion. It's going to be gone in about six weeks or so. And we're going to be looking towards the eastern sky where the fall constellations are now rising. But kind of linking the summer and the fall constellations is a very famous pattern high overhead called the Summer Triangle. And this is kind of a mega constellation, taking one star from each of three separate constellations and turning it into a giant shape in the sky. A great triangle. It's an easy one to find. The stars are bright that make up the triangle, and it's high overhead, away from the lights and the landscape of the city. So the three stars are Vega, Altair, and Deneb. Vega, by the way, is the next brightest star in the sky after Arcturus. So Vega is here, uh, number five on the list of brightest stars. Now, Vega belongs to one of my favorite constellations because it is the only musical instrument in the sky. It may appear to be a fish in our outline, but in fact, it is a lyre, the harp of Orpheus, lyre, L-Y-R-E, and was played by the great hero Orpheus, who sang so beautifully that when his wife died, got bitten by a snake on her wedding day, Orpheus went down to the underworld and played for the god of the dead, Pluto, and played and sang so well that Pluto agreed to give Orpheus back his wife on one condition, a condition we've heard earlier in our show. Pluto said, as you leave the underworld, Orpheus, your wife Eurydice has to walk behind you, and you cannot look at her until you leave the land of the dead. Well, as you probably know, when you tell someone don't do something, there's a good chance they're going to do it. So Orpheus did stop and look back at Eurydice, lost her again for the second time in one day. She had time for one word, farewell, and was pulled black back to the underworld. And Orpheus was in his grief changed into a swan. Swans are a sign of mourning in uh, Greek culture. Here is the swan, the star Deneb, one of the other stars in the triangle, means tail in Arabic. There is the heart, the wings, and the long, long neck of Cygnus. So the great singer Orpheus transformed to a swan after losing his wife Eurydice twice in one day. Big uh, role in pop culture for this story, uh, Hades Town, which won Best Musical last year at the Tonys, is the most recent retelling of that story. But that is nothing compared to the impact on pop culture of the next set of constellations we're going to see. So rising over in the uh, eastern sky here at 9.30 tonight or 7.30 at the end of the month, 
we have a bunch of constellations that all tell one story. Maybe that was a way to remember how all those constellations were placed next to each other in the sky. So it all begins with Cassiopeia. We saw her earlier, the W shape that's also a way to find the North Star. So a vain queen of Ethiopia, she bragged about how lovely she was to the sea nymphs. And they didn't like that, so they complained to their dad, Neptune, the god of the sea. And he made a monster called Cetus that made a mess out of the land of Cassiopeia. So back in those days, what you do is you go and you ask the oracle how to solve your problems. So she went to Delphi to the oracle, and the oracle said, well, there's good news about your problem with this sea monster, and there's bad news. There is a way to stop the sea monster. That's the good news. The bad news is you have to sacrifice your daughter Andromeda to it. Now, Andromeda is in the sky. Her head is here, and she has one kind of bright line of stars and then a dimmer line of stars. So Andromeda, beautiful maiden, although she doesn't win any uh, contests in terms of most beautiful stick figure. There's Andromeda, her head, her shoulders, her waist, and her legs, shackled to a rock by the sea as the sea monster approaches. So Andromeda there. And uh, so there's... The sea monster here, we see it in a depiction from a Renaissance globe. Not a pretty creature, again called Cetus. Now the constellation itself, Cetus, not up yet. It's the last of these constellations of these stories to rise. Uh, but not a pretty sight. Look at those teeth. Look at that mouth. Imagine that coming at you as you're shackled to a rock. But unlike many mythology bits, this one has a happy ending. Maybe that's why Hollywood decided to make a movie out of it. So along comes a hero named Perseus, who is just rising here at 9.30 tonight. It's a little squiggle of stars, almost like, I don't know, a nightcap or a dunce's cap. So Perseus, like his great love Andromeda, is not going to win any competition for having a really beautiful stick figure. But he was a great hero and was actually doing a whole unrelated mission when he came across Andromeda. So Perseus had been sent on a suicide mission. He was told to go and fight the dreaded Medusa, who had snakes for hair and whose very look could turn you to stone. Well, fortunately, Perseus was smart. He decided to use his shield and gaze upon the reflection of Medusa, avoid her gaze directly, and by so doing, was able to chop off her head. So this is actually, uh, you can see the shield in this painting by Caravaggio, and you can see the head with the snakes and you can see the blood coming from where the decapitation occurred. Now, here's a side story. Apparently, Medusa blood hitting the Mediterranean salt water is a recipe that creates flying horses. Because of this blend of Medusa's blood and the Mediterranean uh, was created the flying horse Pegasus. So here is, this is the great square of Pegasus rising as a distinctive fall constellation shares his star in common with Andromeda, and his head kind of goes up this way. I know you're having a hard time seeing that, so let's definitely go to the classical picture. Now, you may think that Percy was, Perseus would say, hey, great, I got a flying horse, but here's his story with Perseus. He already had winged sandals. Here's a picture of his story from 2,500 years ago. Here is Perseus in the middle. You can see his winged sandals. Long story short, he could already fly. He didn't need a flying horse. So Pegasus goes off and has other adventures. Now here we have Andromeda shackled to that rock. Here we have the pig-faced monster, Cetus getting closer and closer. But also look at the bag that Perseus has. He had very wisely taken the severed head of Medusa and put it, the dead head, in a bag so he wouldn't be accidentally look at it and therefore be turned to stone because it could still petrify even as a severed head. So he goes, sees Andromeda, falls in love instantly, sees the monster coming, coming close, swoops down and holds up the head of Medusa. And that turns Cetus into stone. And they uh, then, Perseus and Andromeda get married and live happily for many, many, many years. So if the story sounds familiar, it has been turned into two different Clash of the Titan movies. The more recent one from 2010 made three quarters of a billion dollars. So I imagine some of you have seen that version with Sam Worthington as Perseus and with Liam Neeson 
as Zeus. Now, they chose a different name for the monster in the movie. They call it the Kraken. That's actually a monster from Norse mythology. In fact, the most famous line from Clash of the Titans is, release the Kraken. But the monster in myth is actually known as Cetus and is also a constellation in the nighttime sky. So, I mean, I love it when Hollywood is able to uh, translate these stories, in this case from Ovid, into uh, mythology, uh, into film, and kind of helps us do our jobs. Also, by the way, in Andromeda, we have our nearest galaxy to Earth, the nearest major one, the Andromeda galaxy. Now, we're still looking towards the eastern sky, and it's still tonight. And then not before long, we get to actually see the planet Mars rise. It'll be up by 11 tonight or by 9 o'clock at the end of September. The planet Mars is drawing close, getting brighter every night. It's going to be blazingly bright as we get into October. Every 26 months, the Earth and Mars get close to each other. That's also a great time to send missions off to the red planet. Now, I should mention we're doing a whole Mars and Venus show next week if you want to learn more about the red planet. There were, in fact, three separate missions that have left in July to go to the planet Mars. The United Arab Emirates has launched their mission called HOPE, that is an orbiter. The Chinese have launched a mission called Sky Questioner or Celestial Questioner, that is an orbiter, a lander, and a rover. It's three in one. And then here we have NASA launching Perseverance, their latest rover heading off to Mars. And all three of these missions launched in July and all three are going to arrive in February of 2021. The NASA mission is going to land in Jezero Crater. We know the exact landing date already. It's going to be on the 18th of February at 3 o'clock Eastern Standard Time in the afternoon. And they're choosing Jezero Crater in part because it's an ancient lake bed. So dry as Mars is now, it was very wet once upon a time. It had lots of water. And they're thinking, NASA is thinking, that there could be maybe microscopic prehistoric life that could have got going back in the days when Mars was a water planet. Also, there are other rivers flowing into this lake bed, uh, the remains of rivers. So it just seems like a really good location, both in terms of the minerals and in terms of maybe finding any evidence of prehistoric petrified life on the red planet. And again, if you want to learn more about Mars, Mars and Venus will be the focus of our program a week from today. Perseverance is a rover, so it'll be able to uh, travel around this crater area. It'll even have a little helicopter that can do some scouting for the rover before the rover itself takes the long journey to explore different parts of this crater area. And again, yeah, join us next week for a lot more about Mars and uh, the planet Venus as well. So that is 11 o'clock tonight, 9 o'clock at the end of September. But although we have all these great autumn constellations on parade already, if you're an early riser or a late goer to better, the pre-dawn sky right now is even more full of lovely objects to look at. So all the really bright winter constellations are already on parade before the first light of dawn. So tomorrow morning, here's what you'd see at 5 o'clock or at 3 o'clock at the end of September and kind of anchoring this great parade of wintertime constellations is the easiest of all the constellations to find, Orion the Hunter. Some constellations are famous but not that easy to find like Perseus. Orion has a very distinctive hourglass shape and pops out whenever you see it in the sky. And it's like an old friend when it comes back every uh, August and September as you first catch it for that year in the morning sky. Orion chasing after the Pleiades, the seven sisters, and Taurus the bull. This V-shape here is in between the two. The Pleiades are a star cluster on the back of Taurus and have a great PR agent because everyone knows and loves the Pleiades. The Japanese call them Subaru and put a picture of the Pleiades on every Subaru car ever invented. Now in Orion, in its sword, there is a great cloud of gas that is very much like the gas cloud that the Pleiades were born from. It's called the Orion Nebula. About two years ago, NASA created a new fly-through of the Orion Nebula. It's our nearest major star factory to Earth. So in this great cloud of gas, stars form out of the gas and then light up their parent nebula. 
We're looking down into the heart. The bright stars we'll see in a moment are called the trapezium, and they're visible even in a small telescope, a backyard telescope from Earth. Although as these baby stars light up, the wind from those stars will sort of blow away the gas from which they're born. And so in a few millions of years, there won't be an Orion Nebula. Instead, you'll have star clusters, much like the Pleiades, with a few wisps of gas to remind us of their origins. So the Orion Nebula, we're catching it at that brief moment in time where it actually does exist. It's based on imagery from the Hubble Space Telescope, by the way. So Orion Nebula in the sword of Orion. And also, I wanted to point out that down below Orion, we mentioned the brightest star in the sky, Sirius, is up by right before daybreak. So looking down below Orion, this star here is going to be this brilliant light. As it rises, you'll see it flash different colors. It'll appear to be blue, and then white, and then red. And the, the star itself, Sirius, comes from a Greek word meaning scorching. It made an impression on a lot of people. Uh, we call it fire or aa -ah in Hawaii. So Sirius is just coming up, the brightest star in the sky, rising and visible for about an hour before the first light of day here at the end of August. You'll have a few hours to catch it by the end of September. And that leads the parade of all of these brilliant stars of the winter that form the winter circle, this great circle in the sky that you can catch right now by looking towards the east in the late summer and the fall sky. These include Sirius, which is the brightest star in the big dog, little dog, Canis Minor, the Gemini twins, Auriga the charioteer, and we've already seen Taurus the bull, and around to Orion the hunter make this great wheel of bright stars and constellations that are there in the sky already to be checked out if you want to get out early. Now, they're always there, and again, they come back at the same time every year, will for hundreds of years down the road, but there is a guest star this year only that is not a star at all, and that is far brighter than even the dog star Sirius. So right here we have the planet Venus, the fourth of our four planets that are on parade this fall. Venus about 16 times brighter than the brightest star Sirius. And it's going to be with us for all of the rest of 2020, which is true of all of these four planets. All of them are going to be with us till the end of the uh, 2020 calendar year. Venus is blazingly bright in that it's often our nearest planet, although not always. And it also is covered in bright, shiny clouds that reflect light very well, as do the clouds of Jupiter. And so Venus, because it's covered in clouds that serve as a great reflector of light, it shines at minus 4.5 magnitude compared to Sirius, which is minus 1.4 magnitude. Below the clouds, NASA's been able to figure out the landscape, mainly rolling plains, unbelievably hot, 861 degrees Fahrenheit all the time they, uh, there on the surface of Venus. And so this is both uh, the, a bright thing to look for in the sky tomorrow morning and throughout the fall, and also a bit of a coming attractions trailer if you wanted to come and uh, join us next week for our show about Venus and Mars. We're going to be talking much more about these two planets that in mythology were both opposites and lovers, and that are two fascinating examples of how utterly different two worlds can be, worlds that are on one side and the other of our home planet Earth. So it's a really great time. September is always a great time. You're beginning to get in a fall mood, and there you can go out in the morning sky and see the winter stars. In the mid-evening, you can catch the autumn stars, and as it's getting dark, you can catch the summer stars still. But then joining us uh, this September, we also have every planet except for Mercury in terms of the naked eye planets, all on parade in the course of one evening. Uh, so I just wanted to mention, if you wanted to support Liberty Science Center, there is a donate button, as I mentioned before, and that does help us keep the flame alive of astronomy and STEM education in our region. With that, we'll end the formal part of our show. Uh, so thank you for joining us, and then we'll also check at the questions and see if there's some questions that we can answer before we do wrap up our program. And again, next week, 1 o'clock, we'll be doing Venus and Mars.
We have Venus and Mars uh, next week, and then we're also going to be doing a show on how to spot the space station. All of the shows we're doing, by the way, are listed on our LSC in the House page. We have a lot of requests about how to spot the International Space Station, so we're going to be doing a show about that towards the middle of the month as well. So Kate is wondering, uh, can humans go to Mars? Yes, that is a great question, Kate, and it's a real tricky proposition. On the one hand, Mars is the only one of the planets where it's possible to even think about sending a human mission. But going to Mars and back will take about three years, whereas going to the moon and back with Apollo took about two weeks. And so it's a far more intense undertaking. And we know, thanks to the space station, that astronauts have been able to endure space for up to a year. But the logistics of going to Mars and back are very complicated. And so they're still hoping by the 2030s to go to Mars, but we have to see how the technology evolves. The plan right now is to return to the moon first and then go ahead and sort of test out our technology there before making the giant leap of heading off to the planet Mars. So yeah, so we do have uh, you know, the Milky Way. Again, get out of town to see that or come to our planetarium to check out the Milky Way. As luck would have it, we do have Jupiter and Saturn straddling the Milky Way right now. That's not a law of the universe. It just happens to be where those two planets are placed for this uh, summer. Yeah, Sirius Black. So again, this is one thing I absolutely love about astronomy is the way that astronomy permeates so much of popular culture, often in ways that we don't realize. So, so many names that you find in Harry Potter derive directly from names of constellations and other astronomy lore. And so many constellations wind up appearing in different uh, circumstances. So the Clash of the Titans, exactly the idea of taking the six constellations and taking their story, which is mainly the version they use out of Ovid, uh, uh, the, the Roman poet, and turning it into two very successful movies. Now, the early Clash of the Titan movies, by the way, movie does not get the same love of, as the recent one, was not as successful, but it's a great movie, 1981. Harry Hamlin stars in that, and Lawrence Olivia plays Zeus in that version. And another thing that's great about the 1981 Clash of the Titans movie is that Harry, uh, that the uh, uh, great, one of the greatest uh, animators of all time was uh, able to, as his last real job, do great animation on Clash of the Titans for that one. So check that out. Uh, if you're looking for a movie to watch either, you can't go wrong with either one of the Clash of the Titans movies. They do change endings and do a lot of Hollywood tightening. But hey, Ovid, when he wrote uh, The Metamorphosis, did the same thing. He changed things and tightened up the plot of this old story himself. Uh, Victoria is wondering, is Draco a constellation or a star? So Draco is, in fact, a constellation, and it wends in between the big and the little dipper. It is also the Latin word for dragon. So as is the case with many constellations, when you're saying Draco the dragon, you're saying dragon, comma, the dragon in two different languages. And it was also one of the 12 labors of Hercules was to, uh, was to charm the dragon there. Uh, we have a question from uh, Lisa. Uh, can you recommend a telescope for home use? So we've had great luck at Liberty Science Center with Orion telescopes. Just think of the name of that constellation that we were showing at the end of our show, Orion telescopes. They have telescopes in the between $125 and $250 range that are really great telescopes as beginner telescopes. We, to this day, use them all the time. They're really great for looking at the moon, for Jupiter, and for Saturn. So we've Again, had great luck with Orion as, uh, as a, a telescope. Lily's wondering, do you have a favorite planet? So I love Mars, uh, mainly because uh, I grew up reading science fiction, and Mars figures so well in science fiction. Uh, we had just moved, Mom can remember this, from uh, downtown Worcester, Massachusetts to, to Grafton, kind of a very interesting rough and tumble town. I was having a hard time fitting in in my first year as a sixth grader in Grafton. We had to do a book report. I did a book report on War of the Worlds about Martian invaders and wound up not telling the kids in class how the story ended as the Martians were about to take over all of planet Earth. 
And having left them in suspense, they came up to me in the, in the playground afterwards saying, tell me about how it ends. Tell me how, about how it ends. And so that was my introduction to the appeal of a good astronomy story. Uh, Pisces the Zodiac. Someone is wondering if there's a story about that. That's one that doesn't have many stories behind it. Many stories have elaborate legends behind them. Pisces is two fish tied together by a ribbon. I don't know how you get a ribbon on a fish. They're pretty slippery I've, I, in my experience. But yeah, it's uh, one of the signs of the zodiac, one of the signs behind the sun. A very faint constellation. To be a zodiac sign, you don't have to be bright. You just have to be behind the sun at a certain point during the year. So if you want more about that, by the way, we have a whole show called Astrology and Astronomy that we did a few weeks ago that is on our LSC in the House homepage. And that talks a lot about the zodiac signs, and we identify all of them in the course of the show. So Molly's wondering, when do the planets appear in, in the sky? So if you look south tonight, as it's getting dark, you'll find both Jupiter and Saturn due south. The nice thing about tonight is you're going to have that big old moon right above those planets as well. So find the moon, look down below it, you'll find both Jupiter and Saturn. They'll set as the evening goes on, in the wee small hours of the morning. Uh, the planet Mars will be up by 11, rising in the east, and will be in the sky until daybreak. And then just before the first light of day, around 4 o'clock, you can look for Venus. Mercury not with us right now. Mercury is this uh, planet that appears for brief periods, but being near the sun and moving very quickly, its appearances are very short, unlike all of the other ones. Leo the Lion. So Gloria's asking about Leo. Leo the Lion is a springtime constellation. And uh, I just wanted to mention that it is one of the three constellations that, are, that represent three of the 12 labors of Hercules. So Leo was born from the moon. The Lion of Nemea had an outer garment, had fur that could not be penetrated. And so as the first of his 12 labors, Hercules had to slay the lion, had to strangle it, and then use the lion's own claws to remove the outer garment, which then, in kind of a superhero kind of way, served as this impenetrable outer garment for Hercules as he did his other of his 12 labors. The second labor, Hydra, the water snake, that is also a constellation in the sky, as is Draco. And actually, some of their constellations of the labors are easier to find than Hercules. He's got a pretty faint constellation. Uh, Nevia is wondering, will there be a recording? Yes. The great thing is we have a great team doing this. Everything we do gets recorded within one hour and posted on our LSC in the house webpage. So you just go there and all of this, this show and all the other 20 plus shows we've done by Andrew, by Kristen, and by me are all right there on the homepage. And so, yes, that's a good reminder also, because when I'm, I'm here, talking here at the end of August, you may have a hard time remembering, what did that Shanahan guy say a month ago as you're trying to see the sky in late September? So you can go there for a refresher about what constellations and planets to look for. Does Mars have air? Anne is wondering. Yes, Mars, Anna, does have air. That's the good news. The bad news is it's 100 times as thin as the air on Earth. And what it has is carbon dioxide, which is great for plants, but we need oxygen as animals to breathe. Uh, but it is, uh, and there is enough air, though, that actually the, the new Perseverance mission is going to have a helicopter. You can't have a helicopter if you don't have air. And so the blades have got to be really big for this helicopter in the thin air of Mars, but it will actually be able to travel around that Jezero crater. Uh, so Hannah's wondering, can we ever see Uranus? Yes, actually Uranus is in the skies tonight as well. Now, here's the thing about Uranus. You generally need a telescope to see it. But amazingly enough, if you know exactly where to look, you can see that planet with the naked eye. But no one, no one ever noticed it until the year 1781, when William Herschel in England discovered it with his powerful telescope. So yes, you can see Uranus under ideal circumstances. You can see it without a telescope, but generally it requires at least binoculars to spot it. How big is Earth compared to the, how big is the moon compared to the Earth? Uh, William is wondering. So the moon is much, much smaller. So it's about half the diameter of the United States or in that region. So being somewhat smaller, the gravity is only about one-sixth the gravity here of here on Earth. So this is why you remember seeing the astronauts, even in their heavy uh, outfits, doing big leaps on the moon. 
Well, it's because the gravity is so low because it's a very small object in the sky. Jason's wondering, does Venus have acid rain? Yeah, Venus is a mess. You know, I wouldn't plan, and once we can travel again, I wouldn't recommend going to Venus. The, so the clouds are really thick, and they've discovered that there's sulfuric acid in the clouds. We saw lightning in the clouds of Jupiter. The clouds of Venus also have bursts of lightning up to 25 times a second. And so there's a lot of acidic content in the clouds. And then to top it off, the clouds and the atmosphere trap heat on the surface like glass in a greenhouse. So the temperature is always at miserable 800 plus degrees. So yeah, so someone's wondering if the Uranus question was a legit question. Yes, yeah, so one thing you learn in my field is that every possible Uranus joke I've heard, and when I was younger, I probably made when I was in eighth grade at Grafton High School. But amazingly enough, you can actually see that planet, Uranus, with your own eye if you know exactly where to look. So my favorite constellation, Jamika is wondering, I'm a musician, and uh, I'm fortunate enough not to have enough talent to make a living out of it, because, man, you have a hard road to hoe if you're a musician. But I love Lyra the Harp as the Harp of Orpheus, both because it's the only musical instrument in the sky and because very few other stories have the resonance of the tale of Orpheus and Eurydice. The uh, sense of loss, of trying to overcome the loss of a loved one, of succeeding and then failing again. So when things do reopen, I would highly recommend that uh, you go see Hades Town, which is, uh, tells the story of Orpheus and Eurydice. Uh, uh, it was uh, debuted on Broadway and was, had a, a good run before the COVID closures occurred. And also, uh, if you want to not leave the house, uh, great, great movie, Black Orpheus, 1957 French-Brazilian film, tells the story of Orpheus. They make him a guitar player instead of a harp player, which I also really like. And that is uh, one of the greatest films ever made, in my opinion. So I also love the fact that uh, astronomy ties in so many other things. We all share the nighttime sky. We all have this common legacy of the heavens above us. And so, so many stories draw upon the constellations, the planets, and so forth. Uh, Jason's wondering, have probes been to Mercury? Yes, we've had two missions go to Mercury, including one recently that sent back really amazing detailed shots of Mercury. So we've studied all of the planets. We've sent at least one robot probe to every single planet in the solar system. We topped it off uh, with going past the planet, a dwarf planet, Pluto, five years ago in, on July 14 of 2015. So every planet actually has had at least one either orbiter or probe from planet Earth. Gloria is wondering, when does LSC reopen again? So we're going to open for our members on the Friday of Labor Day weekend. That'll be Friday the 4th. And then Saturday, Sunday, Monday, 5, 6, 7 will be open to the general public as well. We'll be open that weekend uh, from uh, 10 to 4, 10 to 5, 10 to 5. Go to our homepage. We're listing our hours there. We're going to be closed several days a week. So check that out if you're thinking about coming by and seeing us. And we're doing planetarium shows every hour during the day. And the folks that are doing these shows online, that's Andrew and Krista and me, we're also going to be the ones giving you the shows in the main domes. You'll get to see us in our native habitat if you come and join us at Liberty Science Center's Jennifer Chalstey Planetarium. So I think we're coming to the end here. I'm seeing if there's any more questions we can catch for now before we wrap things up. Uh, what happened to Mars and why it, is it dry? Al is wondering. Well, part of the problem is that Mars is really small. It's only half the size of Earth, 4,000 miles in diameter. Didn't do a good job of retaining its atmosphere. And so water nowadays, if you pour water on Mars, it, it turns instantly into a gas without going through a liquid state. So again, three planets that are very similar in their location. So you have Venus and then the Earth and Mars. And all three of them have turned into utterly different worlds based on the circumstances of their exact location and the makeup and the size of the planets. So Mary is uh, saying, is it true that stars twinkle and planets don't? That's another good way, not 100% guarantee, but for very bright planets like Jupiter, Venus, really all the planets you can see right now, 
they're closer to us. And so even though they're shining by just reflecting the sun's light, the planets are basically sending a stronger beam of light to our eyeballs. So their light is not twinkled in the same way as the light of the very distant stars. So not twinkling is also a very, very good sign of a planet, unless a planet's very faint. So when Mars is really far away from us, uh, it's so far away that it can be seen to twinkle. But g generally, yes, Mary, not twinkling is a really good sign that you are seeing a planet. Checking out the questions here. So I think we're going to have to wrap it up here as we're reaching the hour. So I'd like to thank you all for joining us. And again, we hope to see you at Liberty Science Center sometime soon. But we also will be doing these programs. Basically, we'll assess how we're doing in terms of attendance. We're going to do the show every Thursday at 1 o'clock in September. See how that goes in terms of attendance. So we'll be back here with Venus and Mars as our next program here in our series. Again, if you want to support us, the donate button is there, and we do. it does help us to underwrite the cost of these free programs that we're doing for the community. And uh, thank you again for joining us, and we really hope we can see you here uh, in the largest planetarium in the entire Western Hemisphere, the Jennifer Chelsea Planetarium, 90 feet in diameter, where you can see this awesome Digistar software at work in a giant dome instead of on a uh, home screen. Okay, thank you, everybody, and we hope to see you back next week.